Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, getting your nephew to list your Parker Fly on eBay, or else a scrappy upstart looking to ironically purchase that Parker Fly for a tongue-in-cheek photo shoot, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey guys, it's the second Friday of June 2020, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Sebastian who drove a Ford Explorer with tinted windows and a window decal of Calvin and Hobbes peeing on a Macintosh logo. And old Sebastian would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. It's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We have nice things now. We don't have to deal with the Sebastians of the world anymore. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians from around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, mailing list tools, social media integrations. You can crowdfund your next project there. It's a great, great service. Listeners of the Working Songwriter podcast can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Just use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming months, that's going to be a tough thing to do because we're still living in coronavirus world. I will be back soon on my YouTube channel Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern with a new live streaming show very soon, version 2.0, you might call it, and I will let you know as soon as that is the case. Uh, Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, If you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, there's a couple things that you could do. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you love and find meaningful. You head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you search for The Working Songwriter or for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription. If just 1% of our listenership uh, were to kick in uh, just a little something for the show, it would make a huge difference. So thanks for everybody who's done that, and if you're not in a place to contribute financially, totally get that. Um, The other ways that you could help out are actually free. Uh, First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. Um, And the second thing that you could do is just tell a friend that you think would dig the show. The simple math on those last two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there, and I hope you dig today's show. Our guest this month is not only a gifted and celebrated songwriter, but also one of the most important bluegrass instrumentalists of her generation. Sarah Jaros was raised in Wimberley, Texas, but it didn't take her long to reach broader horizons. She signed to Sugar Hill Records before she even graduated from high school. While attending the New England Conservatory of Music, she continued to write, record, and tour, building a national profile. She's also one of the three musketeers in the folk bluegrass supergroup I'm With Her, along with Sarah Watkins and Aoife O'Donovan. Personally, she's been nominated for six Grammys and has won three, and I'm With Her was nominated for two Grammys and took the hardware home with one of them. She's appeared at Bonnaroo, the Newport Folk Festival, Prairie Home Companion, and basically any bluegrass festival worth its salt. She's a regular performer and contributor to NPR's Live From Here radio program. She's recorded for Sugar Hill and Rounder Records. The New York Times has called her a 
Prodigy with the taste and poise to strike that rare balance of commercial and critical success. The Austin Chronicle has dubbed her one of the most stirring musicians of her generation. And The Guardian has called her latest album a classy piece of modern Americana. It was great to catch up with Sarah over the phone this week, and I'm so grateful she took the time to tell us about her story so far. Sarah Jaros, thanks so much for being a part of The Working Songwriter. The first time that I heard you play, it was at Telluride Bluegrass Festival, and I'm looking back, and I'm doing the math now, and you had to be 18 or 19 when you were playing that, which I never would have believed at the time, uh, from your playing, and you were already well into your career um, at that point. Can you talk about how you got started um, as an instrumentalist first so young? Yeah, um, well, tell you, it's funny that you mentioned Telluride, because that festival was a, a kind of a huge turning point for me in terms of go, feeling like I was going from just kind of playing shows around on, on more of a local level in Texas. And um, Telluride was kind of one of my, my big breaks, <laughs> I guess you could call it, um, c- because I was, Craig Ferguson, who runs the festival, gave me my own set when I was 16, actually. So that would have been in 2007. Um, and, you know, I didn't have a record or anything at that point when I played that that set, but um, that's where I actually first met Gary Pachosa, uh, who heard me there, and that's what sort of led to signing signing a deal with Sugar Hill at 16, which, looking back, just even sounds crazy to say, but but it all happened very naturally um, in, in not sort of a, it didn't feel wrong and I still I still feel like it was the right move at the time um, because I think at least working with Gary it was all about the music for him and that's what kind of drew him to me and that's what sort of led me on my path but yeah so it's interesting that Telluride is what you mentioned because that was a turning point but before that it was I, I mean I'm from Texas and it was all sort of Austin Wimberley oriented kind of growing up and playing shows um around Central Texas is really how it started for me. It's really cool that you grew up there because there is such a culture of live music in Central Texas that, you know, even as a kid, there'd be plenty of opportunity to go around and play uh, on any given day of the week. Oh, for sure. Um, Yeah, and I mean, even just being exposed to live music at such a young age, um, I you know, I have memories of my parents, taking me to the Cactus Cafe in Austin when I was really little. I, I feel like some actually my first memories as a human are of that sort of, I think one of the people that comes to mind is Bill Staines. Um, you know, I think they, they would take me to the Cactus to see Bill Staines when I was like three or four. And of course, way past my bedtime and falling asleep <laughs> on, on the, on the chairs. But you know, those, those memories are such a, a part of me. And, um, you know, I think that, that as a kid, just sort of whatever you're around becomes your reality. And so it just, I just was like, oh, well, this is what everyone does, <laughs> you know, like goes and listens to live music. And it's, it's just a part of life. I'll just say that as a parent of a three soon to be four year old, uh, maybe your parents weren't taking you there for cultural enrichment. Maybe they were just trying to get you to go to the hell to sleep. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I'm sure. Did I'm w- sure was the was. Kerrville Folk Festival at all a part of of that scene growing up for you? It was a little bit. I, I um, yeah, I definitely we went when I was younger. It, it, Kerrville. Uh, I mean, some of my friends are that was like their their whole world was Kerrville, and I definitely have been there enough to know that um, it's it's a magical place, but and I had some good times there. But I would say that more of my musical experience was pretty Wimberly and Austin and oriented Austin around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so who were some of your North Stars musically at that time that you really looked up to? Well, it's funny because with um, with this record, it's been actually sort of um, a circling back of, of realizing that most of my favorite musicians and songwriters are all from Texas. But at, at the time... Um, you know, when I was like 11 or 12 and, and starting to really get serious about music and, and starting to try to write my own songs around like 13, 14, my, my heroes at that time were people like Gillian Welch and Tim O'Brien and, um, 
Chris and Sean and Sarah and Nickel Creek um, and Daryl Scott, you know, those are some of the names that come to mind. So it was actually, you know, maybe it has something to do with when you're an adolescent, you're, you're not looking always at what's right in front of you and rather you're kind of looking, um, you want to get out of your town and see the world and, and see the bigger picture. And so I was kind of looking to artists that weren't necessarily in my community for the source of my inspiration. But now as an adult and, and writing these songs on this record, it's like, oh my God, those, the Texas singer songwriters are, are where it's at for me. Like, and, 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 you know, that actually is in line with other people that my parents were taking me to see at places like the Cactus Cafe and One World Theater, like Sean Colvin and Lyle Lovett and Nancy Griffith um, and Guy Clark. Um, you know, all of those people I was exposed to pretty c- consistently just because of my parents. And so the music is in my memory and inside of me, but it's, it's as an adult, it's been so special to sort of hear the lyrics in a new way and, and process them and understand what they mean, you know? Gosh, th- just those four that you just mentioned are such a murderer's row of uh, songwriters. <laughs> what do you think it is about getting older and seeing the world a little bit that, um, that has allowed you to uh, let those songwriters in who, who at the time when you were younger, it might've been too parochial of you to, to have followed. Like, is it almost like you have more confidence in your own voice or, or is it something different? Why do you think you're able to let that into your heart and your creativity now? Um, well, I think a, a little bit of it probably is that, I, you know, I'm, I'm growing and I'm, I'm working away at this and, and, and I probably do have a little more confidence <laughs> maybe. Um, or that can go the other way too, where it's like, I feel like the, sometimes the more I learn, the, the more I <laughs> doubt myself, like sure. there's so much out there. Um, but I think with, you know, it, it's actually sort of like this, something I've been thinking a lot is this song on my record, Pay It No Mind, which is sort of written from the vantage point of this bird looking down at the world from um, a seven story window. And I think that, you know, for me to sort of have this full appreciation of the Texas music and where I come from, I really did have to sort of remove myself from it. And I think a lot of that actually is just natural sort of missing my family. You know, I, I, my parents are still in Wimberley. My family is all still in Texas. Um, and so I think that actually just has a lot to do with it. Like life sort of being very busy and taking me away from the people I love the most and something that makes me feel closer to them is listening to these records by all the people who I mentioned and, and remembering having those memories of sharing that music with, with them and sort of in a, like in trying to write songs that mimic that, that sort of style, it's maybe my attempt at trying to be a little closer to the people that I love and, and the, and the land and the town that I'm from. I really feel you on that. It was my late twenties. Uh, where you're at now, like it was then for me that I started really missing where I'd come from. Up until then, I'd say 18 to 28 or 29, it was all just about, you know, uh, you know, jumping on the ship to, to catch the white whale and go out into the world and write about your age, exactly what you're talking about right now. I, I had a very similar experience happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a little time especially if you're close with your family. Talk to me a little bit about um, the making of that first record with Gary for Sugar Hill. You must have been, I I mean, I'm just assuming at that age and working with um, such an established label and and such an established producer, uh, you must have felt a little bit like a fish out of water there, or am I putting words in your mouth? Did you feel comfortable um, in that process? What did you learn? Um, I actually felt comfortable. I think that's what I, what I was trying to um, express before was that it all felt natural and organic. Like it, it was it, where I think obviously when young people get into this business, there there is obviously, you know, stage parents and there can be toxic situations where kids are being sort of forced into situations that they don't want to be in. Um, that was never what I felt. And so I actually think I music was just such an extension of who I was and it, it, it just was a part of me that it felt natural that I would be, you know, flying to Nashville to, to be making, starting to make demos with Gary in the studio when I was 
um, I guess 17 was, was when we started making my first record. Um, and, and yeah, I think because it all, even though there was, uh, you know, signing a record deal, even though the business part of it was a part of it, that was never the emphasis. And I think the, the fact that the emphasis was always on the music, um, and I really, you know, am so, uh, you know, Gary Pachosa is like family at this point because we've made four records together. And um, it's, I'm thankful to him that he, because I got started at such an early age, he did put the emphasis on the music. And, and I think that's why it always felt comfortable and, and like the right thing to be doing at the time. You guys have made four records together. What, what's the general process for, for cutting those records? What, what's the style and workflow uh, that you guys have found works with one another? We, I mean, kind of from the get-go, um, we we developed a very, I mean, I sort of expressed that I was interested in co-producing early on because I had a lot to say about how I thought my songs should sound. Um, and I, I basically went into all four of those records with um, exactly, basically the exact amount of songs that were on the record. I think Gary Gary was always pushing me to you know, come in, come into the studio and he, he'd say like, come in with 40 songs and we'll, we'll whittle it down to, you know, the best 10 or 12. And that was, you know, because of the fact that I was simultaneously, I was simultaneously in school while I was making all those records. I basically was like, look, <laughs> I barely have time to write 12 songs, let alone 40. So I'm coming in with 12 and these are the ones we're going to record. And, um, and I have very strong thoughts about all of these, but it was great because we, him, he's not a musician and he's just an engineer. So meaning that, you know, when we were in the studio studio together, he wasn't actually playing on these albums. But I think because of that, it, it, we really created a nice balance of him sort of focusing on the sonic aspects and me focusing on the music aspects. Um, but I mean, initially what he brought to the table, which just exploded my world open was, you know, the fact that he was able to kind of say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had Dan Tominsky sing harmony on this and let's call up Dan and 30 minutes later, he's at the studio, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just sort of him, the, the world that I had already started to sort of get into and, and meet some of my heroes through like the festival scene, he just helped me expand that even more and um to get to like w have so many guests be on those first few records was just such an incredible learning experience for me um and that's kind of the way we did it we would record my part pretty much from the get-go and then we would kind of say like who could we hear um layering on top of this and sort of have different people come in um that was kind of our process that's really cool now when you said that from a very early on y you had um you had kind of a vision for what the song should sound like. You know, the, the way that I've heard it described before, someone will say, if you're reading a book of a writer that you love, and then there's one sentence that's like a little bit clunky to you, and you wouldn't have written it that way, that's your voice right there. That's your voice speaking. What was your voice speaking there? What were you not hearing on other albums that you loved that you wanted to hear come forth in, in your music? And, and how were you able to have that voice at such an early age? Hmm. Um, that's, that's good. I, I mean, I think a big part of me actually finding my voice was when I, I relate it very much to my instruments. And I think the main instrument that sort of opened up my world and my voice was when I bought this, um, Fletcher Brock octave mandolin, um, which I, I think I want to say I got it in 2007. So yeah, this was all happening around that time. I was 16 and I had heard Tim O'Brien like playing his octave mandolin slash bazooki on his records. And I just always, my ear really gravitated toward the sound of that instrument. And I felt I, it really almost was an instantaneous explosion of what I felt like was my sound when I got that instrument, because I think when I was playing, I got so obsessed with the mandolin early on and I was really mando focused for mm -hmm. for the first few years and i was writing instrumentals on the mandolin um but like any songs that i was writing starting to write when i was like 13 or 14 i was not writing 
on the mandolin. I was writing on banjo or I was writing on guitar. But then kind of simultaneously to that, I still felt like the instrument that I played best was mandolin. And so when I got the octave mandolin, it was like this combination of, you know, having this lower range of an instrument that's not kind of competing with my voice um, range where the mandolin sometimes was, right? Um, but still being able to translate my technical skills on the mandolin to the octave mandolin. And it was, it was just kind of crazy. Like the, I felt like the combination of mandolin slash guitar feel that that instrument embodied. Um, I, I just started writing songs like crazy and, and I feel like I was able to sort of, because I hadn't really heard anyone else do that. Um, I mean, obviously Tim had done it, but even more in a traditional sort of way, like playing, playing that instrument on, you know, old songs or, and some of them were his, but um, yeah, I think so, just that sonic shift and that sonic change in, in having that instrument allowed me to sort of create something, something that I felt like was original and it sort of started me off on, on that path. Is the octave mandolin, is that tuned to fifths as well? Yeah, it's it's tuned exactly like a mandolin. Um, it's it's G D A E, but an octave lower. And then I some people have it like I the way I have it strong is that the G's and the D's are actually in octaves as well. So it kind of gives this like ringy, almost twelve string guitar type sound to it. You know, I um I will write. I have a a tenor guitar at home that I like to write with. I never end up recording with it, but I like to write with it because I find instruments that are tuned to fifths, you hear the chord structured in a different way, and, and they, they lead you to different melodies, singing-wise. Have you found that, rather than writing on guitar? Totally. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I think just, just the simple, and I think I'm, I maybe heard Bela Flex say this first. He's like the first person I attribute to thinking about this, was just... Yes, like the the tuning, the tuning thing sort of gets you out of your rut if you're if you're always sort of within one tonality or writing with the same three chords or something. Literally, the simple act of picking up a, di- a different instrument um, can set off your creativity in a different way. And so, you know, he he was sort of saying that with instrumental music, mm-hmm. but I think it works it works the same way with songwriting. Where I feel like I go in phases of the instrument that I'm drawn to, to re- like with different records, I feel like, Oh, I was writing a ton on the banjo on that record. Or I was writing a ton on the octave and with this new record, it was like almost exclusively on guitar because I feel like I needed to actually get away from the fifth <laughs> of the mandolin um, and pull my ear out of, uh, out of that rut a little bit. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to the early forties, uh, Sarah Jarreau's uh, all Wurlitzer <laughs> album then. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> that, that'll be my prediction. Yes. All w- Wurlitzer are recorded somewhere in Los Angeles. That's my guess. Amazing. Um, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so that album um, comes out that uh, Sugar Hill does. The Sugar Hill record comes out and it sees amazing success. You're, you're nominated for a Grammy for a Country Instrumental Song of the Year. What did that feel like at the time? It was totally insane. I mean, like I was 18. I was a freshman in college. I was literally in my dorm room with my roommate at the time that I found out. And I mean, you know, I think if I'm being honest, it's like probably most musicians who have been releasing records for years, the Grammy thing is like within your orbit and you kind of hope for it. And you're thinking, man, that, you know, I don't, I'm not basing everything around this, but if that happened, that would be really cool. Right. Um, I There was not an inkling of even like realizing that I was eligible. <laughs> it just, it was so far, like it was definitely a dream. You know, it was something that I had always dreamed of, but you know, it just felt like the beginning at that point and, and I wasn't thinking about it at all. And so it was, it was pretty thrilling. Um, and my publicist, texted me on my little flip phone while I was doing homework in my dorm room. And, and I was sure that she was mistaken initially. And then I was screaming and all of my, my friends on my, um, on my floor all rushed in. It was, it was, it was very, very surreal. Um, but also just super fun <laughs> because you, it was so unexpected. You, you mentioned that at the time you were at college, so you had chosen to go to the New England Conservatory of Music. 
I got to ask why, because it seems like things are going in a certain way. You put out this record, you probably could have toured on it. You probably could have just got, gone into a professional community immediately. Why did you want to further um, more your career with, with formal schooling at that point? Well, I think it was a, a combination of things. I, for for my generation of pickers, I guess, if you could say, um, we were we were really fortunate that so so many of the our heroes and the generation ahead of us had started all these music camps across the country that sometimes were related to festivals like you know Rocky Grass and Lions Colorado had a an academy the week prior to the festival where people who were performing at the festival would teach at the academy and you could like really go and sort of befriend these you know it was like people like Mike Marshall and David Grisman and Chris Steely would be teaching at these camps. And then they, all those people who I mentioned wound up starting this thing called the mandolin symposium, um, in Santa Cruz, which, you know, it actually doesn't exist anymore. So it sort of felt like this, it, I think it lasted for 10 years. It felt like the, it was this golden era of, um, people placing a lot of emphasis on music education within the acoustic bluegrass music community. And, um, so I think because I had gone to those camps, it sort of felt like um, a natural continuation to sort of continue to, to keep on with the music education part of my life. And um, also on, on the flip side of that, my, my parents are both teachers, not of music. So mm -hmm. there was that too, where I think they, they had always placed this, you know, great emphasis on education and, and, you know, hoping that I would go to, to college and, and all that. Um, so I think, you know, and, and then also it, it provided this, this buffer in a way, this like life buffer, because as sort of crazy as it was to sign a record deal at 16 and make my first record my senior year of high school, I think it would have been crazier for me to just go straight onto the road at that point. Like it, it felt like I was somehow preserving a little more normalcy in my life by making this decision to go to school and, and just have these four years of, you know, being around people my own age and being in a new city that wasn't in Texas. And, um, yeah, I think all, all those things went into that decision. And, and being anonymous in a way. Yeah. Or, or I guess sort of the other part of this is that so many of the friends that I had made, going to those music camps across the country in high school were also all choosing to, a, a large percentage of them were choosing to study music in Boston as well, whether that be at NEC where I went or Berkeley College of Music. Um, so it sort of felt like, well, this is where my people are going. I'm going to, I'm going to follow, follow this, you know, and, and we're all sort of migrating and, and this just feels right. Like the people that I, the, the people that were not, this is not Texas related people. These were friends and, and music musicians who I had met sort of all over the country were sort of simultaneously making this decision to move to Boston. So yeah, I mean like not anonymous in that sense, but rather um, like trying to surround myself with like-minded peers. Got it. Talk to me about the period um, after that. So, so you finish school and do you jump into a, a period of pretty heavy touring after that? Is, it, is that when you did the tour with uh, Garrison Keillor um, around 2015? Yeah. Well, I mean, I should say, even though I went uh, to school to try to preserve some normalcy, I was making records and, and touring constantly through, oh, you were. throughout the four years. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like a hiatus or anything. Got um, it. It, basically, it basically just meant that you know, any breaks like winter break or spring break or obviously summers were um, completely filled with with recording or and or touring. Because um, I mean, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, both my second and third records came out when I was in college. So um, yeah, it, it was a little a little nuts. But there was this sort of like, okay, now school is over and I'm just really excited and ready to just focus on on making records and touring. And I think that that, that tour with, with Garrison was sort of at the end of, of that, which 
was my first time like really being on a bus tour and um, it was a month long, like really sort of intense tour, but I just had the best time. Sarah is one of many artists who's had to contend with the problem of releasing an album during a global pandemic. Soon, you'll hear her address the challenges of a socially distanced release, so to speak. She released her latest album, World on the Ground, just last week. There's a beautiful poem by Mary Oliver that describes being human and at the mercy of nature's inevitable, impersonal, an altogether overwhelming force. It's entitled Shadows. Everyone knows the great energies running amuck cast terrible shadows. That each of the so-called senseless acts has its thread looping back through the world and into a human heart. And meanwhile, the gold-trimmed thunder wanders the sky. The river may be filling the cellars of the sleeping town. Cyclone, fire, and their merry cousins bring us to grief. But these are the hours with the old wooden god faces. We lift them to our shoulders like so many black coffins. We continue walking into the future. I don't mean there are no bodies in the river or bones broken by the wind. I mean everyone who has heard the lethal train roar of the tornado swears there is no mention ever of any person or reason. I mean, the waters rise without any plot upon history or even geography. Whatever power of the earth rampages, we turn to it with dazed but anonymous eyes. Whatever the name of the catastrophe, it is never the opposite of love. Talk to me a little bit about... Um, the, the personal importance, the creative importance, um, uh, the spiritual importance of coming together and forming the group on with her. Um, how did that come about and what has it meant to you creatively over the last, uh, what, four or five years now? Yeah, I guess, I mean, six, it'll be six years this six summer, years. actually. Wow. Which is crazy. It, it, it kind of feels like it just, just began in many ways. Um, it, I mean, that band has just, then it felt like a gift that I get to keep unwrap unwrapping um, and experiencing for the first time. I I think the really special thing about how that band came together is that, like, I could imagine that it might look from the outside to people that it was like, oh, this strategic, we're going to join forces and combine our careers and make this, like, super group band or whatever but it was so the opposite of that it really was like once again telluride we all ended up there in in the summer of 2014 separately of each other and wound up being asked to be a part of a, a workshop um i think it was a songwriter workshop actually and there were a couple other people on the workshop but for whatever reason the three of us were the only ones who could like get together beforehand to sort of try to prep something for the workshop and it was that prep where we we had all sung with each other in different combinations of the two of us before but we had never sung all three and it was just one of those magic moments um like like a spark went off in in, in each of us and we my, my favorite thing is it Watkins describes it as like a first date where we had this really fun time, and then we all sort of texted each other after the fact, being like, <laughs> hey, hey, that that was fun, right? We, should we do it again? We should do it again. <laughs> um, that's kind of how it felt. And, and just the fact that it happened so naturally um, made us all even more interested and, and um, psyched to do it. And, and I think it provided, it, I know for me, after making four records kind of straight through um, – and, and the craziness of doing that in school and then with Undercurrent coming out and, and touring behind that so heavily, I was really ready for kind of a shift in creativity. Like, I don't, I don't think that 
after I toured Undercurrent, I would have been ready to kind of turn right back around and say, like, all right, record number five, like, here we go. Kind of, it, it was starting to feel a little like a machine in a way that I think I'm with her was just this beautiful creative opening and it sort of broke up that machine-like energy of, of the way that the music business can feel sometimes. Yeah, you know, I can remember being young, like let's say 21 or 22, and hearing that like some established songwriter was doing a side project. And I remember being at that age thinking to myself, why why would you want to do a side project? Just make your own records, man. Like, why would you ever want to do that? And then the older I get, the more it makes sense. You start to get sick of yourself after a little while if you just write with yourself for too long, you know? Totally, totally. And and I think there also starts to be this sense of when you're writing, if, you know, if you're the only person that you're writing for, if, if an idea doesn't work, there's like frustration because there's nowhere else for the idea to go. Um, and I think for me, like being a part of writing with, with Sarah and Aoife was like the first time I had really, really like dug, dug deep and written with other people because I had actually been very closed off to the idea of co-writing for a long time. Um, because it did feel like such a personal, um, gr- like just inward process, um, writing with them, you know, sort of made me realize that it, this, you know, if, uh, if an idea doesn't work in, in our writing process as the three of us, that's okay because we can use it somewhere else or, you know, vice versa. If an idea in one of my records doesn't work, maybe I'll try it with Sarah and Aoife, you know, and I think just, just to have a little more like less pressure on ideas and to be a little more fluid, have more fluid movement within ideas. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a gift in that way. <laughs> I love the idea of being able to use stuff from your bone pile, your bone pile of your own records, <laughs> stuff that didn't work out, getting to repurpose that. That sounds like, that, that's, to me, at the age 36, that, that basically feels like heroin going through my veins right now. <laughs> <laughs> you just end up with so much stuff that doesn't work, but it, but if you can repurpose it, it, why do you think that that works, repurposing with, with other people? Is it because they come in and fundamentally change the songs or you needed a different voice on them? Why do you think songs that otherwise wouldn't work with a Sarah Jarose record will in that context sometimes? That's good. I, I think, you know, one thing that happened a lot with the I'm With Her writing process um, that I think has actually positively influenced my own writing process is this sense of, you know, a, an idea might not work initially on your own because you don't have to explain it to anyone <laughs> and it might make sense to you inside your brain and you sort of understand the story and, and what you were thinking about when you wrote the song. But, you know, there were a couple of those ideas that I, we all came in with different little, you know, pieces of things in terms of the writing process for that band. And, you know, if one of us would play a chorus or a verse and someone would say, what does that, what does that mean? Like, what, what were you thinking about when you wrote that? And just going through that process of having to explain it and, and explain yourself, I think is, is the thing that sometimes you can't do on your own. But I think that's the thing I've tried to do on my own to, to sort of, um, after writing with Sarah Nifa to sort of look at my songs and say like, does this make sense to someone who isn't me? You know, like, am I being clear enough with my words? Um, yeah. And so I think that's, that's a, a kind of a, just a repurposing idea that, that we were talking about. Like that's how a song can go from not working to working because you have to go through the process of explaining it and understanding it in a deeper way. That is such a fundamental creative problem. The, the idea that when you, when you're younger and you you write something, you just assume that everyone's able to hear it the same way that you're able to hear it. And then as you get older, you learn that that's actually fundamentally your job is to write and compose things in a way so that other people can hear it the same way that you hear it, which is so difficult. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and I think that's something I've thought about a lot on this record and, and actually did a lot of studying of songs of, of many of the Texas songwriters we were talking about before where it's like, okay, so what are the ways that you can do that and be more clear? And it, it really always, I think, comes down to the details of a story where it's not, you're not just stating the feeling, you're explaining 
the, you're, you're painting the picture as opposed to just making a statement. Indeed. In speaking of that new record, talk to me a bit about it because uh, it just came out last week and you actually are working with a new producer this time, John Leventhal. What has the, what was different about the process this time than in the past making records with Gary? So many things were different. Um, <laughs> It, well, first of all, it's the first record that I've made in New York. Um, even though I've lived there for seven years, um, I had made all of those records with Gary in Nashville um, at his home studio. Um, and I was, because when I started making those records, I was too young to stay at a hotel by myself. I I wound up just staying at, living at Gary's house while I was making those records. And, and so what that meant was that all hours of the day were game for working on the record because the studio was just right there uh, in the house. And, you know, that's kind of similar to how a lot of people will sort of have a destination recording session where they'll, they'll all, the band will all go to this, you know, distant location and just you're in work mode for like, you know, two or three weeks at a time and there's no distractions and you're just fully in the record. Um, so that's really how Gary and I made those records. This time with John, it was completely different in the sense that we all, we had like business hours sort of where John sort of said initially, you know, okay, you're going to get here at noon and then leave at six. And those are our working hours. And, um, and I loved it. I loved working that way so much um, because I felt like it, it really kept my ears from becoming fatigued, which just so often happens in the studio. Um, and it really kept me from getting out of my own head and sort of having clarity throughout the process because it was like such a focused six hours of working every day. And then even if you're like still excited and inspired and don't want to leave, you, you walk away and you sort of force yourself to like retain this clarity throughout. So just a simple process of that structure um, was different. But then, I mean, the other big difference is that John is a, mu a great, one of the best musicians in the world. And so he was actually, in addition to producing, you know, he was actually playing on this record and, and we were playing all the instruments together. That's cool. Do you think that you would have been ready? You were saying that when you were younger, it was almost as if it was a good thing that you were just working with a producer who was an engineer because you had something that you really wanted to get across musically yourself. Do you think you would have been ready to make an album with um, another musician producing until now? Um, I think I started on the last album, on Undercurrent was when I started to have inklings of, of being curious about that. Um, but no, I, I actually don't think I was ready. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, Gary and I still had more to say um, together, like through all four of those albums. So yeah, I really, I really felt it was a conscious, it was a conscious decision this time around to, to sort of almost hand over the reins a bit, not co-produce and really try to learn and be led in a way. Um, and, and John just did that in a masterful fashion. And, and I mean, you know, he produced it, but it, w it was a very collaborative experience. I mean, we were writing together. We were playing all the instruments, as I said. Um, so it never, I never felt like, okay, I'm just silencing myself and you take the reins. It never felt like that at all. It, it just felt more like you're a master and I want to, instead of just coming in here with all my ideas are, are clear and I'm, I just have to figure out how to record them. I want to kind of leave a little room and, and see what happens and hopefully grow in the process. What did you learn and, and how did you grow? Was it musical stuff? Was it songwriting stuff? What's something specific that happened that you left the process with that you wouldn't have otherwise if you'd done it somewhere else? I think it was, I, I mostly grew in a songwriting fashion um, because John, I mean, that was sort of the initial thing with John was that he encouraged me to think about songwriting on a deeper level than I ever really had before. And, you know, where I had these 
clear ideas, mostly musically clear ideas in the past. I think, I think because I would get so married to the way um, a melodic idea would lay out on an instrument and the way that a lyric would sort of um, marry with that, I would be, before this process, I would be kind of hesitant to edit my lyrics because I would be like, well, no, but it just, maybe it doesn't make perfect sense, but it really fits <laughs> with that melody in, in mm-hmm. a perfect way. And I would just, after singing it many times, it would be very hard for me to go back and change it um, once I had sung through a song a bunch of times. And so, you know, this time John really encouraged me to sort of just think about it from a different perspective, think about it from not as inward facing, but more of a storyteller. And I think just that simple perspective shift allowed me to try to be, to try to be more of a storyteller. And I think because I was thinking about it in more of a story way and not a a song way necessarily, it was easier for me to kind of go back and, and edit them as if they were stories, not songs. Um, Because I was, often thinking about the lyrics independently of the music this time, which, which was a a big difference. And some, some of what led to that was that um, in co-writing with John, all four songs that we co-wrote on this record, he wrote the music and I wrote the words, Um, Mm. which is not something I've ever done before. I've, I've always, the music is always the part that comes the quickest to me. So I think there was something about removing the musical part of it from my process and just feeling a little more free within the lyrical side of it to, to just really focus and hone that that part of me. That is a really big sea change. I mean, you're, you're talking about aiming at a new North Star. Like, I mean, just the idea that, that that's pretty radical to think about it that way. I'm not necessarily writing a song. I'm trying to, to tell a story here. I mean, that, that does sound like a pearl of wisdom that you would get from a master, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it seems so simple, you know, now in retrospect, it's like, of course, you know, that's, that's what I should have been doing all along, almost, but sometimes it just takes, sometimes it takes somewhat, somebody else to, to point it out and, and um, you know, f- further that shift. It can be very hard to find that person, though, because it's, it's hard to find a person like that who isn't on some... Uh, ego trip or some, you know, wants to manipulate you in some way. It, it's very it's very sacred when you can find somebody. I just made a record with Kenneth from the Milk Carton Kids, and what you're describing working with John, I, I felt the exact way working with Kenneth. Like, I handed over a lot of control, but I was totally cool with it because I trusted him implicitly, and he wasn't someone that was just trying to go on some ego trip or manipulate me. He, he really, he wanted what was best for me. Uh, did how did you have that trust in in your producer John there uh, to begin with? Yeah, I mean that's the, that, that was the word I was going to say is, is trust. Trust is the big word there. Um, well, I think I think I had it because I trusted his musicianship. You know, for I think because in the past I have put music, you know, like the musical side of it first and foremost, almost before songs, even sometimes, Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Uh, I think because I trusted his playing and his, his deep musicianship, that's why I was able to let go. I think it would have been different if I was in the studio with someone who I was like, "Eh, they're not that good of a guitar player, but all these people say that they have some good stuff to say, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. that, that should just, I hope I'm never in that situation because it's like, uh, you know, I, I was inspired to want to work with John because I've put in the time with the records that he's made and the music that he creates. And so, you know, I I really felt that he's I could sort of let go of some of my ego by sort of trying to learn from uh, a master, you know, and I think that that letting go in trust is like one of the most beautiful things that can happen, but it's definitely not easy to find as you said. But um, so, and in that sense, I pinched myself that I even got to work with John and that I, I I sort of went out on a limb to ask him to do it in the first place. Um, But I think sort of taking that chance also was what allowed me to sort of be more open and, and trusting. 
Uh, the other side of your career, which has been just as robust as the recording side, is um, a very robust career in touring and playing shows. Describe to me, not that you have the opportunity to play shows uh, right now, but if you were <laughs> if you were preparing um, your tour right now to go out behind this album, talk to me about how you go about putting together a show. Obviously, a concert is not just getting up and playing a bunch of songs in a row. A concert is a show. Um, you've had 10 to 15 years of, of doing it. How do you approach putting together a show for an album like this? Hmm, well, um, you know, it's funny because this would have been sort of a playing shows behind this album was definitely feeling like it was going to be a shift for me um, in the sense that I was, was, and I guess still am planning on touring with drums for the first time. Oh, um, wow. Because, because you know, drums are basically on every song on this record, almost. Um, and and that that was another aspect of just going back to John real quick. A reason I wanted to work with him is because I've been very hesitant to include drums and percussion on previous records um, because I didn't hear them at all during the writing process in my head. Um, but this time around, when I was writing these songs, I heard drums and I, I, I felt that that was going to be like a, into, like a, a really important part of conveying these songs. Um, so that, and, and that is actually something I think the drum specific part of, of that becoming more a part of my musicianship might be d- directly related to my involvement on live from here with Chris Steely. Um, because, that's really the first over the last couple of years being a part of that show is the first time that I've been on a stage with a drummer regularly and, and sort of learning how it feels to be on stage with a drummer. Um, how how do you have to adjust ever, your playing to, to play with a drummer as opposed to otherwise? Well, I mean, it's been interesting on that show because I do, I've been doing a lot of just singing or not a lot of but more singing without playing an instrument Mm -hmm. um so so i think it's actually allowed me to grow because actually when i first started doing that because chris has this duet partner thing that's what they call it um when i first started doing that you know being live performance for me is so associated with standing on stage and holding an instrument It, it feels very strange to me to not have an instrument in my hands and um like my voice and my instrument are sort of one like they're they're locked in because i've always done them at the same time um but i think that show sort of pushed me when i would have these opportunities to just sing and not play to focus on my vocals in a way and i think even as a mandolin player where the the mandolin is often there's a percussion instrument on a stage, right, <laughs> you know, yeah. in a bluegrass band, it's like, that's the percussion. Um, it made me sort of think about rhythm and feel in a different way to just remove myself from that element of it and be focusing on, on different things, focusing on the vocals, focusing on the way that the drummer is playing behind me. Um, and so I think maybe that's why I was hearing that, hearing my songs with drums in my head, writing this record. But to answer your question, I mean, I actually feel like my my live shows have just been sort of natural extensions of of the records that I've made. Um, you know, I've had a few different touring bands along the way. I, I, I t- played with um, two incredible musicians, Alex Hargraves and Nathaniel Smith, for a long time, which that was fiddle and cello. And so it was very sort of, I mean, the string aspect of that was, a lot of my records, it, it was string heavy. So, and then I, I toured with Jeff Picker, who I mentioned was my, my boyfriend, great bass player, and um, had a couple different guitar players: Jed Hughes, Anthony DaCosta, all amazing players. Um, as the records started to demand different things musically, um, but ultimately, it's like I think just it, it, there's like no way you can almost practice for touring i think it's it's like touring you just have to do it and and it's that sort of night in night out um repetitive nature of it that keeps your chops up and and sort of develops the glue between band members um and i personally have always 
worked with people that I know. Like I've never had a music director hire a band for me because I, I, I don't know. It just feels too, uh, too separated or something. I like to have like a personal relationship with the musicians that I'm making music with on stage. Definitely. Do you, as you're on a tour, are you working as the tour goes on to perfect one single set that kind of, kind of is gelling into shape or do you find yourself going out and night to night um, you want it to look very different because you kind of came from an improvisational background? I would say I generally try to figure out a set that feels good and, and stick with that at least for, at least for like a week or something. I think it depends on how long the tour is. You know, if you're out for three weeks, then I think you have to just for everybody's, sanity you have to sort of throw in little things that switch it up just yeah. for your own sake but also for audiences kind of getting this sense of um just i don't know it, the improv thing you're saying i think i think audiences pick up on they, they can tell when something is new to the musician that's standing on stage in front of them but with that being said i've always had a lot of respect for people who seem to sort of hone in that it's like an art of finding the, the perfect rhythm um, from song to song and when to talk. And um, yeah, I, I tend to lean that way, I would say. Yeah, there's, I, I studied a bit of theater when I was in high school and college and I, the teacher that affected me the most, his saying was always, you want everything scripted to look improvised to the audience and everything that's improvised to look scripted. I've always tried to do that. I love that. Isn't that good? I love that. It's a hell of a yeah, thing. Yeah, that, that, that nails it on the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Sarah, thanks so much for being a part of the show. Oh, wait, before before we finish here, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, what has it been like, what has it been like releasing an album during a pandemic? This this is absolutely uncharted territory. Um <laughs> How has is, how is the, the emotional roller coaster been for you uh, as far as that goes? You've worked so hard on this record, um, and then you release it into a world uh, uh, where there's so much going on. What's that been like for you? I mean, truthfully, it's been challenging. Um, it, it's, been, it's been tough emotionally. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think in the end, I've, I think my mantra this whole time has been to take it one day at a time because it just seems like so, so many things change from day to day over the last two months. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been difficult to know because I think early on, like when, when this all kind of started in March was right before I was actually planning to announce the record in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. So there was this little bit of, you know, talking with my management and, and team about, okay, what, what's our strategy? I think at that point, none of us, no one figured that it would have gone on this long even. Um, so there was a sense of actually maybe delaying is a possibility because maybe everything will be back up and running in a few months and we can just delay and that'll be fine. But ultimately, I mean, I'm, I'm such a planner, like at heart, I, I like to sort of have things set and, and know what, what my life is going to look like in a few months. Obviously, no one can know, but I like to try to do the best that I can to, to plan and, and be prepared. So this, this goes against that <laughs> in, <laughs> in every, every sense of what, what planning means. But um, I think my gut through it all, even in, like, in the first weeks of this, when we were like, should we even announce the record at all, was just to stick to the plan. And, you know, we had put in all this work with this record and I in the end I felt like well it was a gift that we were even able to finish it in the first place and so now that it's done I feel like I want to get it to people and and people can still listen to music at home so that's that feels like in the end I've, I've actually felt really happy that we stuck stuck to the plan and um and put it out on time because it feels like the, the way that I can try to contribute to the world right now um, is, is hopefully these songs can bring a little comfort to people um, or just not, not necessarily even comfort, but like break up the day a little bit and make, make them feel something, you know? And, and I think, I think that's what music has always done for me. And so, yeah, I'm just glad that 
we I mean we we literally mastered the record in like the middle of February so it sort of feels like we got it done just before the world changed um and in that sense I'm glad that it's out and and in the world I'm glad that it's out too I think that that is our job for people during pandemics and otherwise uh that is our job um Hey, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time. I, I really do appreciate it, Sarah. And I hope um, whenever it's legal for us to leave our basements again uh, and play shows, I hope to run into you out there on the road uh, very soon. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. So I'm such a admirer and fan of yours. So I was, I'm honored to, that you asked me to be a part of this. I really am. Well, thanks very much. I, I'll, uh, I'll see you down the road, Sarah. Peace. All right. Thanks, Joe. That's our show for this week. It was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Sarah Jarose's latest album is entitled World on the Ground, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>